Hi everyone, it's Alex Sedrenko here and Sam Savage and welcome to our weekly chance talk. Uh, we've even created our temporary logo uh, for the chance talk uh, webcast uh, channel and um, say hello. I know you're watching on LinkedIn and some of you are watching on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, say hello in the comments, uh, say where you're watching from. We wanted today to start with the questions that uh, people asked at the end of the last week's uh, webcast. By the way, all uh, previous recording of, the, of our weekly webcasts are available on the Risk Academy channel. And as soon as we set up a separate Chance Talk website, we'll upload it all in on there as well. So questions. Uh, the question that was raised most of the time was about risk appetite tolerance uh, and so on and before we kind of get to the mathematical side of the uh, of the question i wanted to do a very quick introduction because i e even though i am very young i am old enough to remember when the concept of risk appetite was created as the management fad you know discipline and i i remember marketing brochures from i think it was oliver wyman saying you know we will help your bank you know set up the risk appetite and then it's set up because for anybody who's watching us you think risk appetite was there forever no it was not it was mid 2000s when this uh, concept kind of was thought of and rebranded because risk appetite as the principle has existed forever you know, any company on the planet has health and safety policy, which has they have you know zero um, uh, zero tolerance to incidents, or anti money laundering policy that has we have zero tolerance to um, to fraud and anti money laundering, and, and so on and so on. There are many risk appetites that are spelled out in local legislation. There is legislation that tells you that certain things are not acceptable for the business, and the business will be fined. You know, environmental damage, fraud, uh, corruption, bribery—all of those things have been legislated, and they set pretty clear, like very clear, um, plain English boundaries on what business should and should not do. And, and then, of course, you know, business find all sorts of clever ways of uh, expanding the boundaries, but the the, the principle that some of the appetites for some of the risks have been spelled out in legislation forever and they existed uh, long before the concept of risk appetite has been uh, created so that's kind of that's that's kind of one third of the of the answer the second third of the risk appetite concept is a, a gentleman's agreement between the shareholder and the management or the shareholder you know being represented by the board and the management so for example the shareholder may say or the shareholders or the you know, or the board may say any investment deal below 10 million can be taken by the management anything above 10 million has to come before the board so the board make the final decision so like it's a gentleman's agreement where the shareholders set some sort of limits and guidelines or for example you know i've worked with a, lot, with a lot of sovereign funds where they would say we would not invest in certain countries or we would not the shareholders would say we would not invest in certain countries or we would not invest in certain industries and, and these are kind of the rules of the game that the shareholder sets. so that's the second third of the concept and then there's the third part of the concept which i think is the most interesting one and it is probably best represented by something like an efficient frontier because basically what it implies risk appetite unlike the legislation unlike the gentleman's agreement with the shareholders it's not set in stone it's something that the decision makers have to pick and choose at the time of making a decision and there is no right answer there are multiple suitable alternatives and which one is selected is kind of product of somebody's risk appetite because they you know they 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 are they they kind of they have pros and cons all of the uh, all of the options some options are clearly completely bad and some options are better than others but within the good options there's usually some sort of 
decision or choice or preference that the decision makers need to make. And Sam, welcome to this week's webcast. I know yeah. perfect examples on this final. Yeah, yeah. So let's, well, let's start out with this. You know, everything Alex said is, is perfect. Let's go to that sort of last version. So, okay, boys and girls, is there a risk that XYZ stock will go down tomorrow? Heck no, I've shorted XYZ. The risk for me is that XYZ goes up. Risk is in the eye of the beholder. That's why in big risk management situations, it's so difficult because you have so many stakeholders, right? And Alex was saying there's like, you know, he calls, talked about an efficient frontier. I think we should, we should take a look at a picture here that I'm actually going to draw if you want to share my screen. So I want to start with um, Harry Markowitz in like 1952. And in fact, let's start with the weak form of the flaw of averages, which says, if you hijack a 747 and ask for a billion dollars and have one chance in a thousand of getting away with it, on average, you make a million dollars. Yay. But if you told your boss, we're going to go make a million bucks and you're really going to hijack a 747, it's a terrible characterization. But the average is correct. It is correct. When you roll a die, the average really is three and a half. Okay. So, Clearly, if I came to you and said, you have a choice of a million dollars in cash, or you can hijack the 747 that I was planning to hijack, you'd go for the cash because there's less risk. So Harry Markowitz in 52 said, there are two dimensions we have to look at. We're not going to look at one number. So hopefully this shows up. Yep, it's perfect. Okay. And so I'm going to call this um, R bar for average return. Okay, that's the average return I can get on a stock. And on the on the other axis, Harry Markowitz used just the raw uncertainty measured by variance okay now this is so th this guy up here this r bar is the mean return on your portfolio and on this axis we have variance or sigma squared and you know i tell people that like you know, variance is like a steam era concept, you know, theory of probability and statistics is powerful and elegant. And it was, and so was a steam locomotive and they were developed. Yeah. In 1952, it was the steam era. <laughs> and not only that, no, Harry did beautiful, wonderful, wonderful work. So just imagine now that I plotted a bunch of stocks and they had computers in 1952 and the computer, I think could handle nine stocks or something before it broke. So now, I've got different investments and the investments appear in this mean variant space as these little things and somewhere. So remember, this is greater expected return going up the vertical axis and more risk on the right. And at the very top, the upper right, we have, um, well, it's the wildest investment in town. Like in 1952, maybe it was Xerox. They were 12 years from the first actual copying machine, okay? So you can't get any more return than that in our little universe of stocks. Now, what Harry figured out and won the Nobel Prize for is let's now specify a return that you want. And he figured out how to 
combine these stocks into a portfolio to minimize the risk. So put the money in the mattress down here. Oops. That just says zero, zero, zero risk, zero return. And then if you combine these, right? So when we combine them, they're diversifying. And sometimes you have things that go in opposite directions and hedge each other. But you get a line that runs up like this called the efficient frontier. And so, well, where should you invest in the efficient frontier? It depends on your risk attitude. If you want to cover your butt, you go down, put the money in the mattress, zero return, zero risk. If you want to go for broke, you put all your money in Xerox. But what you don't do is go anywhere. In fact, I think here, let me use it. Red color. You don't go over there. Why? Well, because I could get less risk at the same return or more return at the same risk. And so this line is called the efficient frontier. Where you go on it depends on your risk attitude. And I'm going to define risk attitude a little better in a second. But I do want to point something out. What's over here? So what's over there was Bernie Madoff, the fraudster. And that's how they caught the guy. <laughs> because this this one guy was looking at his, his he was a money manager and his bosses came to him and said, hey, we want you to, uh, to mimic Bernie Madoff's uh, portfolio. And he's looking at it, he said, that's impossible. Okay, now I want to say something about your risk attitude. And the, the, these ideas go back to, uh, you know, Jacob Bernoulli or something in Switzerland in the 1600s or something. I mean, these are very old, well-formulated thoughts. Okay, so here's the way to gauge risk attitude. See, one of the questions was, how about getting risk down to a single number? That only works for a single person. Or a single corporation may say, this is the way we're, this is our risk attitude, and therefore we'll, we'll minimize this for, minimize the risk for our risk attitude. But as soon as you go to a single number, it's only for one specific risk attitude. So let me define risk attitude here. So I go to Alex and I say, Alex, I'm going to flip a coin. If it comes up heads, you're going to win 10 bucks. And if it comes up tails, you win nothing. And Alex thinks to himself, well, on average, that's worth five bucks. So if you think about the vertical axis here, oh yeah, on average, it's going up five bucks, right? Um, and, and, and I say, you know, Alex, before we play this game, what if I offered you one-tenth of the prize? That is, I say, you know, we can flip the coin if you want, and on average, you get fifth you know, five bucks, but half the time you're getting nothing. What if I give you one dollar to walk away from the game? And so, Alex, what do you what do you say? You're probably I, sad. I, yeah. I'd, pl I'd play. He flipped the coin. Okay. Now, now I come to Alex again. I say, it's the same game as before. The only difference is that if you win, you win um, $100 million. So on average, it's worth $50 million. I say, Alex, you know, same deal as before. I'm going to give you one-tenth of the prize to walk away. So what if I offered you $10 million in cash, Alex? You still want to flip the coin? Yeah, no, I think uh, long and hard about it. <laughs> I wouldn't have to think a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take the money and run. Okay, Bill Gates, he might have to think about it. So depending on whether you're, you know, a, a bum lying in the street or Bill Gates, you've got different risk attitudes and you would pick different things on this curve. So I think I think that's a good start down that path. And I'll be showing an example, hopefully, if we get to it today, that shows where this shows up everywhere in the chance age, right? And remember Alex said, 
You've got a range of reasonable choices. Then you have things that are impossible <laughs> and you have things that are nuts. It's just plain nuts to go over to the right here, take on excessive risk. And uh, I just want to reiterate because for most people, the, the, there were two points that we said. For most uh, people in quantitative risk, it's a given. Um, for people are just kind of beginning to learn uh, about quantitative risk, it's, it's really new and groundbreaking for some reason. Uh, number one, this concept of risk appetite, even though it has been commercialized less than 20 years ago, there's nothing new about the concept. The underlying science and the theories are at least 50 years old and some no, of them are 300. like 300. I think more like 300, 300 years old. <laughs> exactly. So just like with everything we've said before about quantitative risk, you don't have to start from a clean piece of paper. You just have to find the person who's done it or who's familiar with the underlying science because it has been done before. That's point number one. And, and the second point, most decisions under uncertainty, most decisions about the future don't have a clear cut winner. There's usually a couple of options that are good depending on your personal preferences. And this is very important. Even with insurance policies, you know, one insurance policy is better than the other insurance policy only some percentage of the time. Depending on what actually happens, a you know one policy may be better. You know, a policy with a small deductible may be better if there are a lot of small losses versus the policy with a very high deductible if there is a single catastrophic loss. Uh, so nothing is in in risk management. Nothing is set in stone. It's always subjective to preferences and some time, some part of the time. So so listen, I think we should we should. Go back to Harry Markowitz here and say, look, you're not going to effective risk management is not going to be a single number. Th there is going to be give yourselves two dimensions. Give yourselves at least kind of an average result dimension and a tail risk dimension, if you like. Right. I mean, here, variance was sort of like the tail risk. But you could, for example, you could plot the average versus the 90th percentile risk or something yeah, like that. The, the, the VAR, which is which is actually exactly what we do. We plot average versus 95th percentile, which is our VAR yeah. value. And risk. there are other measures. So don't, you know, there isn't a perfect one, but, but you need the two dimensions. And then the way I put it is you develop this curve and the decision where to invest, if you're, if you're a quantitative risk guy, the, the decision where to invest is probably above your pay grade, but you have to show them all the all the possibilities. Absolutely agree. So that's um, I, I I hope that answers the first question about uh, um, uh, risk appetite. There is basically for the, there are three parts to risk appetite. One is legislation and local rules. The second is the gentleman's agreement between the shareholders and the management. And uh, it could be in, like in credit risk, for example, shareholder would say, I am not prepared to lose more than 20 million. So that would be the driver for your limits and your stop losses on credit risk. And he could say exactly the same for market risk. He would say, I'm not prepared to lose more than you know, X EBITDA of my um, uh, uh, two due to price volatility. And, and so that's the second part, your gentleman's agreement with the shareholders. And then the third part, which in, in my experience is by far the most fascinating and where the risk managers can actually contribute uh, a lot of a lot of valuable um, work because they're the kind of the, the holders of the quantitative methodology is the efficient frontier or selecting between alternatives you know, highlighting that alternative a is better than alternative b 70 percent of the time is a very important insight that the decision makers need to have to make to make the right choice or to make the choice that they're comfortable with because there's really no thing as, as the right choice it's just whatever whatever they feel like and, and i i think someone asked also about the um consolidated risk statement. I, I don't want to get into it today because that 
I think we'll do that next time because it really requires quite a bit of time to get into. But in there, I cover a method that Doug Hubbard uses to help elicit the risk attitude of management. There are little exercises you can do, right? A little bit like if I flip the coin, you know, at what level do you, at what monetary level do you, do you go for the coin toss or go for the cash, right? Um, if you will stop sharing my screen for a sec, I want to open some other. Sure. Uh, so in the in the meantime, while you do that, I'll just do quickly do some announcements. Uh, risk awareness week. So by by the way, if you're watching this, and if you are in Copenhagen this uh, weekend and next week for the Firma conference, um, David Vos and I are doing a free seminar on Sunday in the center of Copenhagen and uh, drop me a message if you want to join if you're if you're if you're there in town for the Ferma conference anyway um, if you prefer online events then in two weeks we have our annual risk awareness week where sam is doing two workshops on the chance age and the chanceification um, don't miss that just like every year sam's workshops are amazing and just check out all the other really really good um speakers and that's that's not even the final roster there, there are more more people coming uh coming online uh, amazing workshops don't miss that um there's free access and uh very cheap access for full conferences supported by a lot of wonderful wonderful organizations and the second thing that i wanted to share while sam is looking is the chanceification webinars that Sam is running every month. There are two webinars in the series and check out the dates for October, still coming up, uh, November and December. Don't miss that, it's a two part, one hour on giving chance a chance on the introduction and the probability power grid on how to become the kind of the center of excellence for organizations don't miss those uh webinars sign up for them there are a lot of um, nice bonuses if you sign up for for the webinars it's easy to find the details on the webinars because you just go to probabilitymanagement.org you go under training webinars and it's right there oh it's even easier than that go to chance on the home page chanceage.com will take you there directly just think of chance age, like stone age. Did I misspell it? Chance age, C-H-A-N-C-E-A-G-E. -E. Sorry. My antivirus. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's, it leads to exactly the same page. It's a shortcut. It's a very nice shortcut. Chanceage.com. Uh, and it's also on the home page of probability management. Right here on the right side. All right. Um, Sam, do you want me to share back your screen? Yes. Yes. So, so the advertised topic today was the flaw of averages trilogy. And um, th these are really important things to understand. This stuff appears in chapter one of the flaw of averages book and chapters 11 and 12 you want to understand the math but this is the strong form of the flaw of averages so if you roll dice a bazillion times on average you know a die will be three and a half that's the weak form the strong form says you don't even get the right average and so these examples are available a couple of places if you go to the applications page of our website, we've got the Flaw of Averages trilogy here. And they're in no particular order. Why everything is behind schedule, below projection, and beyond budget. Um, and so I came up with the term, the Flaw of Averages, um, in 2000, I think it was. And that's when I started to write the book. But, but, the flaw of averages implied that everything was behind schedule, below projection, and beyond budget. It was a bad news book. 
Who the heck wants to read a bad news book? Oh, here's a horrible disease. You can't do anything about it. And then after the work with Royal Dutch Shell that some of you are familiar with, we, we really developed the methods of probability management. And so what, what I want to do is um, simply show you a couple of these. Oh, so they appear on this page. But where they are cured is in the chance calc tutorial. So if you go to chance calc, we've got chance calc light, the free version, right? And it comes with a tutorial in which we solve all three of these problems as, as, as you know, as part of the tutorial. But let, let me start with um, with Beyond Budget, actually. And I'll take the one off the trilogies page. So um, these things are documented enough so you can see what's going on. What this is about is that we are, we are inventorying some perishable pharmaceutical, say. And on average, the demand is five units per month. The problem here is that the stuff is perishable. So if, if you stock five units, that seems like the obvious thing, we'll stock five units. If you stock five units and people order and the demand is six units, you can't let the people die. You have to air freight the stuff in. And so I have a little if statement here. Oh, the air freight is 150 bucks. Um, so if if the demand exceeded the amount stocked, you have to air freight it. And in the other direction, uh, it's, oops. there. if the demand was only three and you ordered five, then two units go bad at $50 a unit. And... Uh, so you lose $100 in expiration costs. And notice there are two penalties here. $50 in one direction, $150 in the other direction. Um, this, by the way, is uh, a model I call the double whammy because you get, uh, let's go back to five. Okay. Because you get, you know, if demand is too high, you get whooped upside the head with air freight costs. And if demand is too low, you get whooped upside the other side of the head with, with expiration costs. Now, what we're running this off of is 36 months of demand, right? That's all. Just as a, well, this is what it was. Let's just stick it in and see what we get. And if you do that, then you discover you get an average cost of 161 bucks. That's, oh, look, here's the cost of the average demand. The cost of the average demand is zero. The average cost is 161. That's bad, all right? So let me describe now, that is a case of the strong form of the flaw of averages. And so let me just... Let's take a look. You all, you, you're all familiar with a statistician who drowns in the river that's on average three feet deep. And many of you are familiar with this sobering example of a drunk who is wandering back and forth on a busy highway where his average position is the center line. A way to think about this is the state of the drunk at his average position is alive, but on average, he's dead. And this is just not close enough, even for government work. So one of the things I've done let me tell you what mathematicians call it. They call it Jensen's inequality. That's one of these words that triggers post-traumatic statistics disorder or PTSD. So I called it the flaw of averages, right? And it's been known for well over hundred years, really physicists have known it for probably many, many hundreds of years. Um, and so this is a public relations issue. And so I want to, Hey, I came up with the name. I came up with this example of the drunk. And the flaw of averages, the strong form, has an audio logo. If you don't know what an audio logo is, 
that was Intel. Okay. So here's the flaw of Avager's audio logo. All right. Now, if we go back to this model, what we discover is, let's look at this average cost over here. What if I stocked more? Well, what if I stocked less? Let's see. Let's stock four. Oh, no. You see this? It went up to 228. I don't like that. Thank goodness for control Z. What if I stock more? What if I stock six? Oh, yes, it goes down. It turns out that the stocking the average amount was the wrong answer. And in general, that's going to be the case. So that was beyond uh, budget because you had penalties going in both directions, right? Now let's do behind schedule. Um, so behind schedule is this famous one that, that you've all seen. I have a bunch of tasks in a, in a project and I don't go live until the last task is done. So this is a maximum statement. And that's the only formula in the whole model. And so what I'm going to do here, so you see, the stuff, the stuff on our applications page is left over from like when we started the nonprofit before there was really a cure. But now there really is a cure because now in the age of chanceification, I can run out to a website and I'm going to grab a stochastic library. So I right click, copy link address, go back over here, activate chance calc, grab what's on the clipboard, takes a little while for it to wind its way down from the web. And then I've got more things in here that I actually need. I don't need marketing. I just need these first four. And again, I've done this so many times. You, you can probably recite this in your sleep. And I click OK. And we're not in Kansas anymore. Oh, my gosh. We're either in a Rick and Morty cartoon or Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Good. Then once I've done that, I can find out the actual average. So, of course, I can find out the chance of things as well. But let's just go for the average of this thing. Oh, and you know what? I, I'm going to go back to the, me the metadata and say, let's put in the average of 10 weeks, because we know that is the average, right? So, the flaw of averages says, says that plans based on average assumptions are wrong on average. Right. I plug in the average assumptions of 10 weeks, and I go live in 10 weeks. But on average, and let me put the, uh, let me put a little histogram. Let me put that up here. Okay. Oh, on average, it's almost 15 weeks. Not close enough, even for government work. Okay, now let's do. Uh, below projection. And in the meantime, thank you everybody who is commenting. Hi to Malcolm, Mirza, Simon, Amarul. Thank you for watching. Ask questions. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, so here is a capital expenditure problem. Every business has this. It's, it's how much do we invest in the face of uncertain demand? So in this case, think of it this way. Maybe I'm just, um, yeah, I've got to decide how big to build my factory for one year of production. And by the way, 
this thing that I'm selling is so terrible. We're only going to sell it for one year and then <laughs> no one's ever going to buy it again, right? So it look, it's easier in many of these problems to, to limit your time horizon to one period. You can do it in multi-periods, but then I couldn't finish in another five minutes, right? So, um, okay. So think about it this way. We believe the demand is going to be 100,000. That's the average. Therefore, we produce 100,000. The cost per unit, if we're going to produce 100,000, that means $30 times 100,000 means we spend total cost of building our factory of 3 million. But if we sell the 100,000 at 40 bucks a pop, that's revenue of 4 million and therefore the profit is a million. Now let's remember, how do these problems begin? The boss comes in, says, Alex, what's profit gonna be? And Alex says, how do I know boss? I don't know what the demand is. But by the way, everyone has agreed that the average demand is 100,000, right? So the boss says, give me a number. Correct me if I'm wrong. Of course, the boss says, give me a number. And then you say, oh, would you settle for an average boss? And the boss says, if it's all you can give me, you say, well, that's easy. You do agree, boss, that the average demand is 100,000, right? The boss says, yes, I agree. Oh, well, then that's easy. Then on average, we'll make a profit of, of uh, a million. <clears throat> oh, is that wrong? Let's find out what happens when I put in an uncertainty. I'll put the cursor there. I go off to the library, the stochastic libraries. I'm gonna grab product demand, copy the link address. Put it there. Use what's on the clipboard. Put product demand in there. Click OK. Well, now let's look at this. Trial one. Let's, I think trial nine is a real bad one. Let's see, is trial nine bad? Oh, yeah, trial nine is bad. See, notice this is auditable because it's a stochastic library. Oh, yeah. You know, on trial nine, we lost $325,000. Well, but how about trial one? The demand was 141,000. Yeah, but you only built a capacity of 100,000. You're capped. Here's a business with a downside and no upside. You wanna be watching out for these. These are landmines. Well, let's just see what the average profit is. I'll just go down here. What do I mean by average? So what I mean by average is, we look at this in a thousand parallel universes. All the universes are the same except for one thing, the demand, which obeys that distribution. So I go down here and uh, let's pick the average of that. That's the profit. And you know, I'll put the, uh, I'll put the distribution next to it over here. Oh no, 600,000. Now, just why is the shape like this? Well, obviously you capped out. You couldn't meet the demand when it exceeded 100,000. And you, you say, well, I know how to fix that. I'm going to order 120,000. Oh, no. Now my profit is 280,000. Look, you can't do this in your head. Thank goodness for Control Z. If I order 80,000. Now, I, there isn't time today to go into this in more detail, but we're going to, next week, we'll, we'll discuss this again in terms of risk attitude. Oh, if I order 80,000. We, we, we did cover it uh, last week, uh, which was a very good example. So do um, go to the YouTube channel uh, of Risk Academy and just watch our recording, our webcast from last week, because it is a very nice illustration of risk reward where you know, 
spoiler alert, it, it actually turns out ordering anything above 70,000 is plain crazy. Exactly. Okay, so let's remember. We put in, I go to the mean or the average, but in the average demand, you make a million. On average, you make 600,000. Okay, now I want to do one other example that, that's kind of a knockout. And this is one I love to do live, but we can't do that here. So what we're going to look at now is we, we are bidding on a gas property. And, you know, I think, well, yes. Yeah, so, so we have someone selling off like, you know, this is like a, a million cubic feet of gas or these are MCF. So this is like a billion cu cu cubic feet of gas. It costs you nine fifty to pump it out. The market price is ten bucks. They're saying, "Well, given the market price, this is worth five hundred million bucks or something." Okay. The question is, what if market price isn't certain? Sure, the average market price is ten, but there's a big spread. And so the question is, what is this worth on average? And I have auctioned this off to people to see what, what they think. And everybody thinks that because of the uncertainty, the value must be less than 500,000 on average. Let's take a look. Oh my gosh. The profit of the average is 500,000. The average profit is a million. The flaw of averages can cut both ways. It can either mask risks you can't see, or it can mask opportunities. So in this case, where's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is this. Let's look at some trials. Trial one. Oh, at trial one, the gas price was $8.56. Was $8 well, that's below your pumping cost. You're not going to pump it out for gosh sakes. You're just going to shut it in. Okay, how about trial two? And oh, four. Or you make a little over 540. Trial three. 635, you shut it in. Trial four. 1132, you make 1800 bucks. So, whereas the capital investment model had a downside and no upside, this has an upside and no downside. And um, I do want to leave you with just one picture here. Um, So where does the flaw of averages come from, the strong form? It comes from if statements or max statements. It has to do with non-linearity. Let me start with the below budget one. And by the way, this is discussed in chapters 11 and 12 of the flaw of averages. So this one is beyond budget. So here's demand, D for demand. And here is five. And here is cost. And if demand is above five, I have a heavy penalty cost on air freighting and new stuff. And if the demand is below five, I have a lower penalty of um, expiration costs. 
But the point is, it's not a straight line. That means it's not linear. And whenever you have a nonlinear relationship based on uncertainties, you get the strong form of the flaw of averages. You get the wrong average itself. That's basically it. Um, I, I, if you're interested in this, chapter 12 of the flaw of averages explains a bunch of cases. And, um, but you, you, you've got to be aware of these nonlinearities. That's like sort of first, the first step of detecting landmines in your business plans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And next week we will talk about um, uh, Maximilian's question about risk aggregation and roll up. And exactly. uh, we will even touch on utility theory on how to aggregate unaggregatable risks and the downside of that. Right, right, right. And you know, we have talked about with the aggregation, you, you do need a chief probability officer to make sure that everything is coherent, right? And so I think it'll be kind of a broad overview. There is the consolidated risk model, which is a very nice one and, and brings in Doug Hubbard's approach to assessing risk attitude among management. Um, again, you've, you've seen the shell example, but just a reminder, you've got global uncertainties that tend to make everything move together. And you've got local uncertainties that are sort of idiosyncratic. Um, and, but by the way, please feel free to uh, ask questions about your own modeling issues. That's something that's really useful, I think. Um, and Max, that, that goes for you. If, if you, if you uh, can give us a, a really sanitized version of a problem you're working on, it's really interesting to go in, build a little model that we can send you as a, a first step. Completely agree. Um, and a quick reminder, Risk Awareness Week in two weeks time and webinars are happening every month. Check out the dates. And that one you get to with chanceage.com. Great, Alex. Always fun. Thanks, Sam. And I'll see you next week. Next week, I will be from a hotel in Copenhagen. Uh, I, and I think I'll have a lot of interesting stories to share from one of the largest European physical conferences. Very nice. Still not as big as Risk Awareness Week, but, you know, they try. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Bye-bye. Right, um, thanks, Sam. See you next week. Um, all right. Any any more questions, thoughts? Any other topics you want us to cover? Uh, so the the only other other comment I have from last week, Ali wanted to talk about um, decision making criteria for switching between systems, and uh, um, I, I don't really I don't really have an answer for that because not not my area of expertise. So I. I wouldn't want to make up stuff. Any other thoughts, questions? Anything you want to to discuss quickly before I log off? All right, risk awareness week in two weeks. Don't miss it. Um, it's going to be really fun. Program five days, each day has its own theme. Risk management one versus risk management two on the 17th. Risk identification and the psychology of risk taking, risk perception, neuroscience, cognitive biases on day two with some you know, mind blowing presentations. Uh, Case studies on quantitative risk analysis that significantly outperform heat maps and save a lot of money on day three. Uh, practical case studies on how to measure effect of different mitigations and how to select the best mitigation strategy, again, quantitatively, 
um, on day four. A lot of interesting case studies and um, yeah, some fun debates around the usefulness of different insurance products. And day five is all about re risk reporting and integration of risk information into performance management and management reporting. Um, Norman and I are going to do a little debate around ERM and whether there is absolutely any value in in it. Uh, and don't forget, at the end of each day, day five, day four, uh, I'm doing a live debrief of the day with the summary of all workshops. So in case you missed missed something, I'll broadcast uh, those uh, online. Um, Hernan, see you in Copenhagen. Thank you. And uh, Simon, thanks uh, asking a thank you for asking a question. Let me quickly read it. Um, Simon, do, do you mind clarifying your question? Used computational to achieve, tools to achieve what would be tough analytically. Um, I, I mean, we Monte Carlo, most decisions that our department gets involved in, um, for example, how big is environmental you know, exposure from water pollution or which insurance policy provides the better coverage. And it is impossible, not tough, it's impossible to come up with the conclusion um, just intuitively, analytically, or using uh, judgments without uh, without running the calculations. Um, so so um, if I understand your question correctly, we do that all the time. Every single decision, we would simulate different scenarios. Um, because it's uh, it's 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 quite a challenge to do that uh, to do that um, analytically any other thoughts questions if not again a reminder if you're in Copenhagen next week uh, do come by and uh, join David Vos and I for an afternoon tea in the city center before we all go to the firma registration and we're running a workshop. The agenda for the workshop will be how do we make money and save money from risk quantification? Because to my surprise, I've, I've discovered, I've run a survey on LinkedIn with 200 something participants where only 10% of the respondents said that they've actually made a lot of money for their companies, either through saving or uh, additional revenue generation, made a lot of money, a lot of money um, for their companies using risk analysis, quantitative risk analysis. And I'm obviously one of them because that's why I was um, selected as the best risk manager in Europe last year for the $13 million we ended up saving on insurance uh, through risk quantification. So to my surprise, my huge surprise, this is somehow news to people because most respondents said that risk management should save and make money. Uh, and they wish it could, and uh, about 20% even said that that was never the objective and it shouldn't, um, which, uh, of course, are very surprising responses. So 90% of the people haven't had the experience of saving millions of dollars through risk quantification. And that kind of explains why I think there's still debate of whether, you know, we should quantitative versus quality. Like, I don't, I don't understand... Um, I don't understand how this is still a discussion that, you know, qualitative versus quantitative. It's, you know, you, it's like astrology, astrology versus astronomy. You spend, you, you discover space and you spend, you send, um, you know, spaceships into the space on one and you create horoscopes on the other. You know, th these are just uncomparable things. It, it's, I don't know. It's like comparing, uh, vegetables to space, space rockets. They, they, they're not even on the same, you know, on the same, same uh, level playing field. Uh, so um, I was, I was very surprised to discover that people still think that quantitative is a maturity journey that you need to grow into, and it's not for every company. Um, 
I, I was very surprised to discover that because to me, uh, that was um, that was really a given. I, I thought, you, you know, I, I had no trouble ever justifying a month on quantifying something because I knew on the back of it I could probably save a dozen million dollars uh, quite easily. Either that through modeling for um, vendor accreditation or vendor risk assessment or third-party risk assessments or water pollution or air pollution or insurance or investment decisions like whatever whatever application of quantitative risk analysis we uh, we did it was always a no-brainer uh, for the management that uh, the effort was justified because the savings were so significant and and, and thank you simon i'm also looking forward to risk awareness week uh, I think it will be very fun. A and and I have an amazing idea for the Risk Awareness Week in 2020. What's the year now? 23 for next year. So for next year, I'm going to do something very different and I hope much more exciting for the Risk Awareness Week. Um, still virtual, don't worry. I hate physical events. Uh, still virtual, but I, I, I want to try something much fun because I want people I, I want people to really appreciate the learning opportunities and just you know share and uh, educate their staff and their teams on some of the things that um, you know Sam and Doug have been doing for decades and that's that's the thing about risk awareness week you know if you've missed 2019 you're such a like, like I envy people who missed risk awareness week 2019 because the workshops that Sam did and Doug did in 2019 are still as useful today as they were then. And the knowledge that you can take away from those workshops is really amazing. We've, we've actually been applying that in our work ever since. So thank you, everyone. Good luck, have a fun week, and we'll see you next week.